Expository preaching is that method of pulpit discourse which consists in the consecutive interpretation and practical enforcement of a book of Holy Scripture. It differs from topical preaching, which may be described as the selection of a clause or verse or section of the inspired word from which one principle is evolved and kept continuously before the hearer's mind, as if on angels or on the doctrine of the Trinity or on justification, as the preacher traces its manifold applications to present circumstances and to human life. Then there's doctrinal preaching, which prosecutes a system of biblical induction in regard to some great truth, such as justification, regeneration, the atonement, or the like, gathering together all the portions of Holy Scripture that bear on that particular doctrine, and deducing from them some formulated inference. Then there's encouraging preaching, which we call hortatory preaching. It sets itself to the enforcement of some neglected duty, or the exposure of some prevalent iniquity. Biographical preaching then also takes some scripture character for its theme, gives an analysis of the moral nature of the man, like that which Bishop Butler has made in his wonderful discourse on Balaam, and points from it lessons of warning and lessons of example. All, however, regardless of which one we deal with, doctrinal or topical or encouraging or biographical or narrative, all, however, have expository elements to them. Exposition must enter into every sermon. Consideration should be made of the mind of the Holy Spirit in relation to the passage being exposited. That is what the preacher is supposed to do. Give the mind of the Spirit to the hearer. The preacher's job is to bring the mind of the hearer into direct and immediate contact with the mind of the Spirit. This is where the power of the pulpit exists. Such preaching will promote biblical intelligence among those who hear you preach. Consider this. You ask me what time it is. And so let's say, for example, you ask me that, and I answer this way. Well, the first domestic clocks in the early 15th century are miniature versions of the cathedral clocks, powered by hanging weights, regulated by escapements with a foliot, and showing the time to a great man's family and household by means of a single hand working its way around a 12-hour circuit on the clock's face. But before the middle of the 15th century, a development of great significance occurs in the form of a spring-driven mechanism. It's called the fusee. Did you know that there's such a thing called a fusee? And it's a cone bearing a spiral of grooves on its surface, which forms part of the axle driving the wheels of the clock mechanism. You're thinking right now, what in the world is he talking about? Well, this is the point. If you were to simply ask me what time it is, the answer is the time. It's not how the clock was created, or how it functions, or the mechanisms inside the clock. People don't want to know what every Puritan, reformer, English, or American commentator thought on a particular passage that you're preaching on. When one asks what time it is, you look down at your watch and you tell them what the fingers point to or what the digital readout says, and that's it. William Taylor gives this warning. One thing, however, the preacher must guard against. He must not turn the pulpit into the chair of the exegetical professor and spend a long time in hunting down some poor Greek participle or digging up some obscure Hebrew root out of the ground. Processes are for study. It's for you. It's not for those people that are listening. Results are for the pulpit. That is what you are to transmit from Scripture to the ears, minds, and hearts of the hearer.